Thank you, Tom. And uh, I'd just like to say what a pleasure it is to participate in a U.S. Center event. Uh, there has been a full and fascinating lineup of events here over the last two weeks, and uh, everyone I've caught has really been uh, just a stellar event. Hopefully we can provide the same. Um, so my name is Josh Bashinsky. I represent OPIC, which is the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. We're the part of the U.S. government that mobilizes and catalyzes foreign direct investment into over 150 countries around the world. We're a development agency, and we use private sector tools, loans, guarantees, political risk insurance, etc., to support projects in some of the most challenging markets around the world. And climate change and clean energy have been an enormous area of growth for OPIC. We see a direct connection between a growing middle class, the attendant demand for energy, the need for sustainable jobs, and we think that renewable energy presents an enormous opportunity to meet those challenges while protecting the climate. Since 2010, OPIC has committed over $7.7 .7 billion to clean energy projects in over 40 countries with a total potential capacity of thousands of megawatts. And we've also supported 18 off-grid energy project providers. And our off-grid portfolio across the developing world has grown to more than $140 million, which has brought light to families and villages located far from, the nation, from their nation's electricity grids. And our team is quite proud of our agency's pioneering role, but I would also be the first to offer qualified optimism. It's the case that the finance and economics of renewables is undergoing a revolution and the physical products and financial tools available to bring clean energy to the world have seen radical improvements in just the last five years. But many challenges remain, and we must deploy effective tools to address those challenges. And today we're shining a light on one of the tools that we believe is key to unlocking the necessary financing to effect a rapid clean energy transition. And perhaps nowhere is a better example of the need for these innovative tools and the opportunity than in India where, according to the government, only half of rural households have access to electricity, and the growth in total capacity has not kept up with demand, and re reliability is a constant challenge. But fortunately, clean energy is an area of deep collaboration and sustained collaboration between the U.S. government and the government of India through a variety of initiatives across our governments, from forestry to uh, grid reliability to the initiative we're going to talk about today. And India has built on its own ambition in deploying renewable energy, setting a target of 175 gigawatts of renewables by 2020, including 40 gigawatts from rooftop solar. And Prime Minister Modi has set forth a vision of providing 24-7 electricity access to every person in India. But as Dr. Stramali will tell us in more detail, there's an enormous financing gap we must overcome in order for India to achieve its clean energy and energy access goals. And to meet that gap, this year, our governments, during the visit of Prime Minister Modi to Washington, D.C. in June, committed to the creation of the U.S.-India Clean Energy Finance Facility. And I'm really pleased today to highlight this joint initiative between OPEC, the government of India, and leading foundations. The facility will address a key financing gap in the Indian distributed solar market by funding early stage project preparatory work, which, as we'll hear more about today, is one of the key areas necessary to unlock sustained financing and build the business models that are going to be necessary to bring clean energy to the world. And at OPIC, we anticipate that this program will unlock up to $400 million in long-term debt financing from OPIC and other private sector investors. And before I turn to some of our key partners in this initiative, I'd like to tell you why we're particularly excited about this facility. About four years ago, the US government, recognizing that small amounts of targeted financial support can help renewable energy projects overcome the initial hurdles that often hold back an innovative financing, innovative idea from becoming a game-changing financing reality, rolled out the U.S. Africa Clean Energy Finance Facility. So in collaboration with USTDA, USAID, and the State Department, OPIC launched this fi f financing facility to support early stage projects that can 
then reach the point where long-term capital from development finance institutions, MDBs, and private investors can viably invest. And ASIF has worked extraordinarily well to catalyze investment in these crucial projects. Through our Africa facility, USTDA and OPIC approved funding for 33 clean energy projects in 10 countries throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. This represents nearly $1.5 billion in potential public and private capital and approximately 358 megawatts in new renewable power capacity. And these early stage investments have shown enormous amount of progress and shown results in the form of OPIC committing long-term debt financing. Uh, as an example, uh, we supported a distributed solar company called Nova Lumos with a $150,000 investment to do early stage project preparation work. And we're really proud to say that recently we committed $15 million in long-term debt financing to Nova Lumos, which represents just how promising this approach can be. The other innovative feature of our India facility is that it demonstrates the power of public, private, and philanthropic collaboration. In addition to our partners in the government of India, we are proud to be supported by a number of leading U.S. foundations, including the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and the Good Energies Foundations. These foundations have recognized the opportunity to leverage their dollars and drive significant investments in distributed solar, and we're really pleased to have them as a partner. And unfortunately for us today, India's parliament is in session, uh, necessitating our partners in the government of India to return home to support parliament. Um, but I just want to take a moment to uh, express my deep appreciation for the really productive relationships that we've developed in um, collaboration that they have shown together with the foundations and OPIC to launch this facility. And I've really um, uh, just been impressed at how much we've accomplished in the few short months since announcing this facility. And I also want to express appreciation to the Climate Policy Initiative, which has consistently demonstrated thought leadership and how to drive climate finance in India through a number of initiatives, including the India Innovation Lab for Green Finance. CPI is partnering with us to stand up this facility, and you'll be hearing from Dr. Shramali this morning about how this uh, facility addresses the key financing gaps. At the end of the day, our goal is to accelerate a rapid clean energy transition and do it using targeted developmental investments. OPIC will continue to support off-grid and distributed renewable energy com companies throughout the, the developing world. We have a conservative balance sheet, we have expert staff and a mandate to take a long-term perspective, and we're uniquely qualified to approach these problems for years to come. And the end result will be worth it. Around the globe, there are 1.2 billion people who have no access to the grid, millions more with unreliable power. US ISIF, is, our clean energy finance facility, is an example of how we can leverage proven effective tools to bring clean, affordable, reliable power and light. And with that, I'm really pleased to introduce Justin Guay, who's a climate program officer at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. Justin's a truly innovative thinker on how to use philanthropic funds to mobilize finance for climate change, and we're really pleased that he and the other foundations that are supporting this initiative are partners in this effort. Thank you. Can we be a little more relaxed about this, or do I need to go up? OK, excellent. Um, well, first and foremost, on behalf of all the US foundations who are participating in these facilities, we want to thank Josh, OPIC, and the US government. We've had a really excellent experience partnering with the US government um, and really appreciate all of the efforts this administration has done to address climate change. We also want to thank the government of India for its support in standing up these facilities. Um, so my role on this panel is to help explain why U.S. foundations would want to partner in this effort. And I think there's three main questions I wanted to answer. The first is why India, of all places in the world. The second is why finance, of all issues or themes to touch on. And then the third is why OPIC, of all partners, to choose. Because at the end of the day, when money is your main tool, you have a serious threshold to uh, 
pass, which is opportunity cost. What else could we be doing with our scarce money to more effectively create change on, on climate? Um, so first, why India? So we work uh, in the US, the EU, India, and China, amongst uh, several other geographies. Um, and when we look at all of those geographies across all of the sectors we're very interested in, we see India as the biggest opportunity in the world today for a number of reasons. Um, potentially most importantly, particularly given the current U.S. political state of affairs, is the political will that we see in India. The Modi administration came in with really impressive targets on clean energy, a significant and deep commitment, uh, and we think that it behooves us and everybody in the international community to ensure they're successful in this effort. Uh, so, you know, as a kind of first order of business, we're very excited to see India succeed in those, in those goals. Um, I think the second main reason that foundations are very interested in India is that Historically, climate and development have been at loggerheads. It has been something that has been difficult for those who care deeply about climate change to, to address the development challenge that exists right alongside climate. And I think in India, we see a unique opportunity to transcend the politics, the divisive nature of those two issues, so that we can uniquely align development and climate priorities with the use of distributed clean energy in off-grid areas, amongst other places. So for us, this is really a transformative opportunity, not only to address both climate and development goals, but also to work with partners in the government. Um, Second question, why do we care about finance as a unique strategic lever? Uh, part of this is that we haven't done a huge amount of work on finance in the past. We're really excited to be doing more, uh, working with partners at Climate Works and, and other partner foundations. Um, and when we look at the world of finance, uh, I think it's really easy to get daunting, to get to be daunted by the sheer scale of the task. Uh, the clean trillion sounds like a lot of money. Um, and it is, but if you look at the global economy, there's something like $88 trillion worth of economic activity every year. Trillion dollar economies are regularly produced. Um, and so we think that this is not an un unsolvable challenge. And we think that one of the biggest barriers to getting to the clean trillion is identifying risk tolerant capital that is wisely deployed and aggressively embraces risk. And so we as foundations with a unique flavor of money, grant dollars that are guaranteed negative 100% return that are magically refreshed every single year, have a very important role to play in aggressively buying down risk, leveraging investment and catalyzing that clean trillion. So we're really excited by this partnership, really excited by the opportunities to do more in this space. Um, and the last point I would make, um, why OPIC? So, you know, for a long time we have been impressed with OPIC's commitment to clean energy and we think they punch well above their weight when it comes to these issues. You know, if you look at their uh, balance sheet, it, Josh was, I think, humble. They are investing something like a quarter of the total investment across the agency in clean energy, which is amazing. Uh, it's really impressive, and they were some of the very first uh, people to really embrace this, this challenge and to, get, to dig in deep. So we're really proud to be partnering with them, proud to be partnering with the U.S. Uh, government on these efforts. Um, and of course, very, very proud to be partnering with the government of India. So um, hopefully that helps explain a bit about why foundations are interested in these facilities, why we are particularly excited. Uh, the last thing I would say on just a more personal note is that um, we've been working on climate for a long time. Long before the current political turmoil in the United States, we will be working on climate long after the current political turmoil. So we want to just let you know everybody in this room, our partners in the government, our partners in India know that we are in this for the long haul and that we will be here to, to work on climate uh, for, here, for now until we solve this problem. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Happy to ask, answer any questions when we get to that. And I want to introduce uh, a trusted colleague, uh, great guy, Dr. Garish Shramali who uh, has a long list of accolades, which I won't even attempt to uh, get to here, other to say that we are proud supporters of the Green Finance Lab initiative in India that Dr. Garish Shamali is currently leading. And I'll turn it over to him to help talk about these specific facilities. Uh, thanks, Justin. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming this morning. Uh, I am Garish Shamali, and I am the director of the India Office of Climate Policy Initiative. And uh, my job was to explain what this facility means because I'm not sure if it's clear to you what it really does. So I'll try to do that in about five to ten minutes. Um, 
But before I start, I, I want to make sure and I want to emphasize one thing that there's this increased emphasis and realization that we need to move closer to action. And this is an example of an action-oriented facility. So please remember that we are actually so close to action on this. And that's what excites us, OK? Um, before I talk about the facility, let me give you an introduction to Climate Policy Initiative. We are a think tank. We are a global think tank. Uh, we are focused on energy policy and finance. Um, and in India, our work is mostly on clean energy and finance. Um, and the one goal if I have, or what we have, is to basically help the government of India to get to their clean energy targets. And how do we do that? Is by enabling the flow of attractive capital. Um, and I just want to talk about this initiative that we started last year before I get into the clean energy finance facility. It's called the India Innovation Lab for Green Finance, which is another example of innovation that's focused on implementation, okay? It's essentially a public-private partnership where we involve stakeholders from multiple uh, areas. We work with policymakers, we work with financiers, we work with people in the industry. And the whole idea is to identify, develop, and implement innovative financial instruments. Um, just to give you an example, what happened last year, we have finished our first cycle we had an open call for ideas. We received about 60 ideas, and ideas that came from everybody, and including people in this audience. Um, and we chose four of those ideas to work on, and I'll just give you an example of those ideas in a bit. We worked on those ideas for about a year, and in October, which is last month, we endorsed three of those instruments to move forward for pilots. Okay, so another example of innovation, where we are working with multiple stakeholders, where we are working on implementing something on ground. Okay? Now, how does the public-private partnership work? What we do is, as I said, we work with multiple stakeholders from the government. So we are working with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, who has endorsed the facility, or the Innovation Lab. We work with the Ministry of Finance. We work with the public sector banks, with the private sector banks. We work with renewable energy developers, large-scale, small-scale, basically anybody you can think of. The three ideas that came out were, one was a rooftop solar financing facility to provide a debt finance to the rooftop solar sector. And if you know the context of India's goals, this is in the context of the 40 gigawatt rooftop solar goal, which is part of the overall 175 gigawatt goal of renewable energy by 2022. The second one was a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform for providing debt finance to small and medium enterprises. And this is again addressing a key gap. Small and medium enterprises are either unable to get finance for their own projects or for projects they are doing for other facilities. So the idea is to de develop a platform that enables access to debt. The third facility uh, addresses Another problem, which is the problem of currency hedging. And the currency hedging costs tend to be high in India, which basically what it does is it increases the cost of capital, which makes renewable energy expensive. But the whole idea, with the, I want to give you the examples to get you to a point to understand that these are ideas and pilots that are focused on addressing specific problems. Now coming to the focus of today's talk, which is the clean energy finance facility. But before we get to that, I have to lead you through a story, because we have to go somewhat top down. Because when I say project preparation, it doesn't mean much to most of the people. Okay? So where we have to start is, again, as I said, India's renewable targets. It's 175 gigawatts of renewable capacity by 2022. Right? Out of that, is sol solar is about 100 gigawatts. Out of that, distributed renewable energy, which is what this facility focuses on, is about 40 to 45 gigawatts. That's huge, considering that we're sitting at around one gigawatt of distributed renewable energy today. Now, if you look at the investment requirements, 
for this target, we need approximately $200 billion. $200 billion. And you can ask the question, you know, why are we worried? Why do we have facilities like that? We did some analysis earlier this year, which showed that we are, gonna, we are likely to fall short of that target by about 30% in both equity and debt. So we need to be able to get additional finance. Okay, so this is the high level context. Now I want to steer the conversation more towards distributed renewable energy and debt finance. So what we are gonna focus on in this facility is debt for companies that are focused on distributed renewable energy. And what do you mean by distributed renewable energy? It's essentially smaller scale projects or what we call non-utility scale projects. Projects that are smaller than one megawatt in capacity. So these are rooftop projects on roofs. These are off-grid projects, which are in villages, mini-grids, against you know, anything you can think of, but essentially non-utility scale, non-large scale projects. Now, the need, the need, and this is what I am coming to, the need, the need for debt finance in this sector itself is around 40 to 50 billion dollars, okay? That's huge. And what makes it hard is this is at scale. This assumes that companies that are going to get this, this debt finance are going to be at scale. But the real story today, that most of these companies are small. They're new, they're small. Most of these companies have not achieved scale. So what we call they are at a startup phase, okay? Now, when companies are in a startup phase, they need certain sources of capital to grow and get to scale. It's called startup capital. And this startup capital is used for multiple purposes. One is to grow the business itself. Second one is to do project preparation. And I'll talk about what project preparation means. And third is to get to scale. And that includes also demonstration projects. So essentially what the companies need is, they've started working, they've gotten some grant capital, some equity capital. They have to get to scale. And to get to scale, they need debt, debt from OPEC and other institutions. They are looking for debt capital of two kinds. One is what we call is working capital. It's a kind of a generic catch-all term. And working capital is essentially for providing short-term liquidity relief. When you're buying inventory, you're holding inventory, you have to pay for the inventory, you need this working capital. But the second kind, which is what this facility targets is, how do I get a company that has demonstrated that it works, but it wants to go to scale. It needs to go get slightly larger amounts of capital. And that's where debt capital becomes very important. Now they can go to the market and look for debt capital and it's not easy. Because banks who provide debt capital, especially private sector banks, especially in India, they tend to be risk averse. They will not provide debt to these new small entrepreneurs. As simple as that. And that's where OPIC comes in, because OPIC, being a development financial institution, will take that risk, right? They will provide debt capital. They will be the first movers. So we appreciate that, right? OPIC has, OPIC is willing to take that risk of providing debt. But even OPIC has its requirements. OPIC will not provide free money to anybody, right? OPIC needs to understand that projects are investment ready. And what does it mean, investment ready? You have to show through multiple documents that you're investment ready. For example, when you're submitting your loan application, you have to show that your cash flows are to be trusted. You have projected some cash flows, they have to be trusted. How can OPIC trust your cash flows? One way is for you to show that you have a certain number of customers coming in the pipeline who will have certain systems on the rooftops and those systems will generate a certain amount of energy which will generate some revenue. Now to generate that certain amount of energy, OPIC needs to be confident that the resource assessment study that how much solar energy you will generate is accurate. And that study has to be done by somebody trustworthy, a third party. 
right? That's just an example of project preparation, but there are other things that companies need to do. And all of these cost something. There are legal studies, there are financial studies, there are customer due diligence studies. There are even IT systems that you need to put in place to track your revenues. You have to show, give comfort to OPIC. And these are all things that need money. What do we call? They cost something. And these companies being new and small, they don't have the money to do these activities. And without the, the, these activities, the application to OPIC is not complete. So there's a gap here. You can see that. And this is exactly what this facility does. It will provide grant capital for these activities called the project preparation activities so that the loan application to OPIC is ready. It's investment ready. Okay? So hopefully I've given you enough background on what the facility does. Just to describe the process in one last minute, um, the idea is that companies, and if there are uh, entrepreneurs in the audience, the companies will apply for OPIC loan through this facility that we manage. We will assess the loan applications, we'll identify if there are gaps in project preparation. Once those gaps have been identified, we will hire third party consultants to do those activities, the project preparation uh, activities, and pay them. So the facility will pay for those activities, and that's where the facility comes in. And then, once those activities have been done, we'll put the whole application together and pass it on to OPIC for debt funding. And, and what this facility is doing is increasing the probability of getting OPIC finance. And it's not only going to be OPIC finance, it's going to be finance from other DFIs, OPIC is planning to pull in not only other DFIs, but other private sector banks. Um, the one last thing I will say here is that this facility, we are hoping to launch it in Q1 of 2017. So please keep your eyes and ears open for the first call for proposal, or call for ideas, or call for proposal here. And once the facility gets started, we'll basically be on a rolling basis accepting applications and going through the process. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what we are going to do here. We are very excited about it. It's uh, supposed to be a $20 million facility, so it's a lot of projects that we are hoping to get. So please think about submitting your own applications, telling it to your friends, and creating the project pipeline over the next four years. Thank you very much. All right, I think we'll open it up for questions at this point. So please raise your hand and I'll come over and give you a microphone. Right. Please introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Ilmi Granoff, um, uh, the Sustainable Finance Director at Climate Works Foundation. Um, first, I want to say that um, we have been s fantastically happy to support in the design and development of this, and um, particularly. Um, the aspect that has been most, meaning, mo most meaningful to us in terms of making this a priority is um, helping India uh, achieve its own development objectives, its clean energy target, which is an incredibly ambitious target, also an achievable one, and the ability to accelerate that and, and contribute to that process is a really uh, fantastic opportunity. Um, and particularly to focus on the areas where our uh, resources and uh, sweat equity and uh, efforts can be the most useful. So my question is actually around um, getting into a little bit more around the distributed generation and rooftop solar challenge because um, what is the most interesting about this is that of the 175 gigawatt target, India is well on its way to achieve that target in many of the markets that are relevant, including utility scale solar, which is extremely competitive in the Indian um, power sector. Um, but the biggest challenge is scaling up the distributed generation target, where that, that has the longest to go. And it would be great if the panel could speak a little bit about why this is needed for achieving that target in particular. What is, what is unique about that target? Um, I, it would be great to, to, to dig into that a little bit more. Um, and also why, uh, uh, why you think that um, 
philanthropic capital specifically um, is valuable for the long, what the impact of this will be on the longer term development of that market. Since this is a lot of money from the grant making side, but is a small drop in the larger scale of the market we're trying to create. So why this money up front, how it's expected to change this market so we get to the tens of billions of dollars that we need, hundreds of billions of dollars we need for this, for the sector. Great question. So um, I think when we looked at the Indian clean energy targets, the biggest question mark we had was how will India achieve the distributed targets? You can see the Modi administration moving heaven and earth to make the utility scale targets reality, and they're doing really an impressive job. We, we really think that that is going to happen. Um, but there was a huge question mark over how you make a rooftop solar sector not only thrive, but uh, grow from its very nascent state. Um, and so Bloomberg New Energy Finance just came out with a recent report tracking investment flows, tracking growth in those markets. And quite frankly, uh, to our shock and pleasant surprise, the rooftop solar sector is the fastest growing sector in all the power space. 90% annual compound annual growth rate over the last four years. That's jaw dropping. Um, so I, I think I would say there's a lot of uh, barriers still to address, which Garish can um, talk about, but I, in, I personally am now incredibly bullish on that space. Um, when it comes to the off-grid space, though, I think there's still a lot more challenges. You see in, in the Bloomberg numbers that solar home systems and lanterns are growing, growing quite strongly, but they're not growing to address the scale of the challenge. And I think that's where we need more uh, of these kinds of facilities that can buy down risk. And really, I think we have to recognize that this space, the off-grid space, and then even more importantly, the mini-grid space, really requires dedicated long-term soft support. We can't yet jump to the fact that these are commercial markets. They require grant dollars. They require long-term subsidized loans. Because they have such an outsized development impact, I think that's really important. So um, there's a lot of specifics we can get into, but I just as a th high-level thought, I guess the message I would have to this audience is, I am concerned about the long-term growth of mini-grids in particular, um, and I think that the development community needs to step up in that space to make, it, to make good on the promise they have for both development and climate. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I'll just focus on the rooftop sector, and just to give you the context, um, again, the India's rooftop solar target is 40 gigawatts by 2022. Uh, right now, we are sitting at about one gigawatt which means we need to do another 39 gigawatts in the next five years. And it's a daunting target. Um, and uh, the likely, you know, what, what, is, what you're likely to achieve is perhaps half of that, but even that is huge. Um, and we did a study recently um, looking at what are the challenges to this rooftop solar sector. And the biggest issue is access to finance. And not only access to finance, but access to debt finance, because even though the sector is growing really fast, most of that growth is funded by equity, right? So why is debt finance not coming into this sector? And the reason is simple. This is where the utility scale solar was five years ago. Banks are basically not comfortable. It's a new sector, there are new companies, there are small companies, there are no track record, right? Somebody has to come in and take the risk, right? And that's what OPIC is going to do. So, I think with this OPIC facility, and, and, and I, want to do, I do want to mention that OP, this is one facility. There are other facilities like that that are being put together. World Bank just announced a $625 million facility with the State Bank of India to provide loans to the rooftop sector. KFW has a facility with Areda. Um, and what's happening is that even these facilities are not able to lend to this sector. Because again, they're applying the same lens that traditional banks apply. So you have to get away from that lens of, oh, we need collaterals, we have to trust the company's founders, et cetera, et cetera, which is true. But what OPIC does is gonna do pro true project-based, project finance-based project finance funding, which is gonna depend on how the companies are gonna do, how their cash flows are gonna look like. So I think it's a true innovation, and it's going to be a breakthrough initiative. Anything you want to add? All right. Do we have any more questions? I know we have one right here. Do we have any more? I can take two at a time. All right. If not, please introduce yourself. Thank you. 
Um, good morning. Um, my name is Sonia Birdi. I'm a member of parliament from Kenya, being accompanied by another member of parliament who's just sitting right there. Um, my question is uh, to John, uh, to Josh. Uh, any ideas or any insight on what uh, uh, you guys might have done um, in Kenya? Uh, anything coming up? And secondly, uh, how can we get your details? Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, so we actually uh, have done quite a bit of work in Kenya and supported a number of off-grid companies, either through our uh, ASEF, our Africa Clean Energy Finance Facility, um, which is uh, still supporting projects through, throughout Africa. Um, and I, I'm happy to uh, you know, put you in touch with the folks who are, are running that facility. Um, and we, we also uh, just um, recently uh, opened a field office there as well, and I would be more than pleased to put you in touch with our folks there. Um, what I, and, and I guess maybe in, in part to answer your question and also to, to echo um, what's been said in response to the last question is that I think what we're doing, and actually Kenya is an ex excellent example of uh, this, we've got a ton of innovation in business models across the distributed solar marketplace. And OPIC, having done uh, almost 20 off-grid projects uh, in the last few years, has been really on the leading edge of supporting these projects and trying to figure out what business models work in what context. And to be honest, uh, it has been an incredible opportunity, but also a challenge because um, not only are we supporting the sort of smallest companies that are doing this sort of work, as, as Dr. Shramali pointed out, we're also um, looking at really rapid innovation in business models, whether it's mobile payments, um, you know, for pay as you go, whether it's leasing models, loans, uh, there are just a variety of financing tools and there are a variety of um, products available. Honing in on what works in what markets is what we're trying to do. And we recognize that one challenge is you are providing long-term financing for in a rapidly evolving market, which we're happy to do. But through programs like ICEF and, and ASEF, we're able to have support for some of the diligence required to give us a little bit more confidence that we should be making uh, these bets in challenging markets. And um, we, we see it as a real opportunity, uh, both in Kenya and India and, and around the world. And we're really pleased to see the level of innovation uh, that's going on. But there's a lot more to be done. All right, do we have any more questions from the audience? Well, I have a couple of questions, if that's all right with the, the panel. It seems pretty obvious what you were talking about, that this model could be effective in other places besides just India. Could we maybe elaborate a little bit more on kind of this being an example to maybe go uh, other places around the world? And my other question just to end is, well, how, if someone here is really interested in this project, who should they contact? Where should they go? Um, what information should they begin to look for? Sure. So I'll, I'll just take the first one quickly. I, I think anywhere, uh, and, and you see this around the world where, where there is um, both an ambition either through NDC implementation, energy access goals, um, energy service provision goals to uh, drive distributed solar. I think a, this is a model that is worth um, pursuing all over the world. And we, we have seen it. We have a Caribbean facility that does this, as, as, uh, as Grish mentioned. There are uh, others in India. Um, I, and then to the second question, we're really um, looking forward to partnering with the government of India on the rollout of this program. You'll, you'll be, really be able to see, um, uh, at, I think, Areta should be launching a, a website um, that will provide, essentially, the information you need to um, get in touch and work th with CPI to uh, apply for the program. Um, in the near term, I would uh, encourage you to reach out to any of us, um, but particularly to Garish, uh, if, if you are interested in pursuing the program.
Yeah, just to add to what Josh had said, um, so we are uh, about to formally launch launch the program, and then we'll have a website set up and a generic email. Um, in the meantime, please do watch our website, the Climate Policy Initiatives website, because we'll have the announcement on our website um, with a link to the website of this program. And, and please do feel free to reach out to any of us, in particularly me. So uh, I'm happy to share my email address after this. All right, thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? All right, if not, I'd like to thank the panelists for a nice round of applause. <laughs>